So my name is Bill Weatherholt. I'm an assistant professor of geography uh, at Frostburg State University in Western Maryland. Um, just sort of the cruising altitude of this brief little talk, um, Appalachia, Maryland, I'll sort of go over that. The rationale for why I'm trying to incorporate OSM into my, into my work. Some initial lesson plans that I've already articulated a little bit. If you went to the Mapping USA, I had a lightning talk. Um, a little bit of this should be familiar. Um, some student impressions, sort of where we are now, we being me, essentially, uh, and future directions at, at uh, Frostburg State. So usually when people think Maryland, sort of conceptually, your place conception is either the Bay or the Wire or the suburbs of DC. Um, but the three westernmost counties are actually considered Mountain Maryland. They are a portion of the Appalachian Regional Commission. Uh, and Frostburg State straddles, it's sort of the, it's in Allegheny County, which is the middle one, but it's right at the county line. It's the westernmost community in Allegheny County. It's a pretty, almost a 50 mile wide county from east to west. So we're smack dab in Appalachia. Um, why I'm trying to incorporate this in my own coursework is I have found teaching the fundamentals of cartography that there have been varying degrees of success using things like ArcMap, ArcGIS Pro and some of the other peripheral sort of software. Um, and in response to that, I have found myself shifting more towards open source material. I've rewritten some of my, my cart labs from ArcMap to Pro, and I'm now begrudgingly thinking about writing them to QGIS so that students don't need to be in our labs using the stuff, like, stuff behind paywalls. Um, OSM for me sort of started with Penn State's geospatial revolution. I don't know who's familiar with that or not. Um, and I show it to my human geography course and to my, my 100 level classes, sort of how geospatial is entwined in everything that we do. Um, and serendipitously, I met Stephen Johnson at the AP Human Geography reading in 2019. I think that was the only year uh, that Teach OSM was there giving sort of a how to use OpenStreetMap. And I, I went. Uh, and it was enjoyable and through some conversations and pinging slacks and emails back and forth and talking to Stephen, sort of talked about where I could take OSM at Frostburg. Um, and just looking at the map, if you zoom in in Western Maryland or in Appalachia in general, there is not as much volunteered information as you would find in the more metropolitan areas. And so that was sort of the, the spark for where I could start. Um, and then really with COVID and being forced online for a year, it made sense for more web mapping sort of things that I should try to come up with. Um, and really the, the broadest push is just for geographic literacy. And I don't know who's familiar with the Roper report. It's a little bit dated now. Um, but in 06, National Geographic and Roper essentially they conducted a study with American adults 18 to 24, so the, the young adults of our, of our country, and they asked them a few different kinds of questions, sort of factual knowledge about important events as far as populations of particular countries, things like that, general, like, when you think geographic trivia, um, a hypothetical map and a set of some actual maps to try to discern um, their ability to find specific places, to identify key landmarks or where things have occurred in the news. And what they found was actually really depressing. And we're not, I'm not going to belabor you with all that information, but I highlighted that on the survey, most young adults demonstrated a pretty limited understanding of the world beyond their own borders. And towards the bottom, that neither war nor natural disaster really has seemed to compel young Americans in learning more about the world around them. Um, and I stress this not so much in my fundamentals of cartography as much as I do when I'm interacting with all majors and trying to bring them over to the dark side into my department. Um, and it says, also striking is young Americans' ignorance sort of of how we fit in the wider world. It was just the, that myopic view of, of young, you know, just the youth. And moreover, their lack of knowledge doesn't seem to alarm them. They don't really care that they don't care. Um, and when you take all that together, that doesn't really bode well. Um, we're, not, we're not giving people the tools they need to succeed to make sense of an increasingly complex world in which we find ourselves. And so that push for OpenStreetMap, I think, kind of addresses that, just sort of spatial literacy and spatial thinking. And it all starts at the home, 
Uh, and so my little one's not old enough to start messing around with OpenStreetMap or else he'd be messing up tags and everything else. But trying to increase just geographic literacy and understanding where we are in the world, and I think OpenStreetMap resonates with that, with that, larger, that larger push. Um, so what I'm doing in terms of my own pedagogy, what I'm teaching in the classroom, uh, I now have three labs specifically devoted to OSM. The first one is really introductory, sort of how to set up an account. We watch a couple of videos, like how to, you know, like how to do a road, how to do a building, um, and then create 10 change sets and give me your username so I can go in and look at your edits and see if you're squaring your buildings and if things look okay. Uh, and then sort of going to that Western Maryland DARF, that, that lack of geographic knowledge that's in the map, so go to somewhere local to you and contribute 40 change sets. So it's trying to get them into like just how to use the software. And then the last one at the end of the semester, I incorporate the hot tasking manager, sort of show them the bigger picture. I'm sure you've been mapping Western Maryland or you know your suburbs, wherever you live downstate, but how does this, how does this connect to the larger world and where, you know, where does it all fit? Um, and student impressions have been pretty positive. Uh, and this, is, this material was from um, the surfing, U the, the mapping USA. Um, and I couldn't get new stuff because I haven't, this is, the, this is actually Wednesday's lab. So they'll start, get, they'll be introduced to OpenStreetMap when I fly back to Maryland. But uh, one student said that um, a mapping software like OSM can empower communities, especially small ones, because of how user-friendly they are to anyone. And personally, that student wished that they had known about the website in high school because they can think of a lot of different sort of applications in which this software would have utility. And OSM can empower communities in a multitude of ways. First, anyone can log on and contribute. It's like the group project that doesn't fall to just one person. Everyone's contributing something to the overall knowledge of the whole. Next, those that are part of marginalized groups can take back space that may be incorrectly mapped and remap it in a way that's truthful to them. And I think just sort of these, these undergraduate impressions really sort of fall in line with everything I've heard in these last two days at this meeting. Um, sort of where we are now, I, I don't know like, what the newest youth mapper chapter is, um, but I'm the advisor for Gamma Theta Upsilon in my department, the International Geographical Honor Society. Um, and I housed a new youth mapper chapter in, in sort of our GTU society just because it was easier. We already had a constitution and I could just push it right through. Maybe not the right way to do it, but I did it anyway. Um, and during GIS Day last semester, during Ge Geography Awareness Week, uh, we had a mapathon and introduced the, some new mappers on how to use OpenStreetMap, and we had pizza. And it was a bit of a muted affair. You know, we had masks on and we tried to distance somewhat, but the reception was positive. And there's grumblings that we're going to do something in April for Earth Day. So there's some talk of doing another event. Um, I think it would be great to get students of mine to hear more people in the trade and what you all have been doing. I think it would be really beneficial um, for my students to hear some of that. I'm for sure just a beginner, so I, I don't know much about Jossum. I put it on my laptop, but all I would do is make a mess. Um, so I need to learn some more, so I'm, a better, so I'm, I'm better at this software and I can teach it better. Um, I've thought about maybe a special topics. The, this ecosystem is so large and so robust that I could absolutely fill 15 weeks of material in different, different avenues of OpenStreetMap. Um, there was a talk la yesterday about microcosms and I thought that was really interesting. So maybe a Frostburg microcosm. Uh, we had colleagues in here at WVU and Frostburg and WVU are less than an hour from each other. Um, so in terms of where to start, I'm tied into National Road. That's the first federally funded highway in the United States. Um, it's a pretty key corridor. And maybe starting there and putting information along key corridors like an arterial road and then using uh, branching off from there and filling in more information. I don't know. Co-conspirators welcome in Appalachia. Um, and some of that work is actually tangential to what I do in terms of my own research. National Road, like I mentioned, the first federally funded highway in the country. It was completed in 1818, uh, and it connected Cumberland, which is the county seat in my county in Allegheny, 
uh, which is where the Potomac River is. That was George Washington's westernmost outpost. Um, there's actually a western port, Maryland, in my county, which was the westernmost port in the United States, sort of back in the, the history of the country. So you talk about St. Louis as being the gateway to the west, that's the gateway to the west. That's getting up and over, getting up and over those mountains. They're not very big, but doing it in a horse and buggy was pretty intimidating. And it connected the Potomac River in Cumberland to Wheeling, West Virginia, and the Ohio River. Um, so it was a really major corridor, and now students don't think about it. They just get on the interstate and go flying right by. Um, but this military historian, John Kennedy Laycock, um, he has this whole series of postcards from over 100 years ago, and I really like qualitative methodologies. And so I've been trying to go out in my abundance of free time on the tenure track. I got tenure two weeks ago. Um, but on the tenure track, thank you, um, trying to go out and repeat some of these scenes. Um, and this shot here, you can sort of see. So I would like to maybe try to incorporate, I don't know, I don't, there's not a whole lot of visuals in OpenStreetMap, but I've thought about, I mean, I have all these different spots where I'm trying to go out and revisit and maybe try to incorporate that either in open historical map or in some other, some other sort of open context where anybody can go out and revisit the scenes and sort of see where things are. And that idea of using National Road as sort of a, you know, an arterial starting point, you can see National Pike. So Cumberland Road, National Pike, National Road, they're all synonymous with the same transportation corridor. Um, and this Kemp Drive, I did, I mean, there was nothing there and it's digitized all the, all the houses on that. So that kind of an idea. Maybe somebody on the other end of National Road want to meet, we can meet in the middle and digitize anything that's there. So I don't know. I, I'm relatively new to OpenStreetMap, but I think that the, I think the potential is certainly robust. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the organizers and the university. This really has been a, a lovely conference so far. And with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah. Thanks.